from her pocket and starts putting it on the table. I, I just lost it. I, I, I said to my wife, finish up signing this book for this. And, and I said, no, no, put that away. We gave the books to the ch- child, you know, to the child. He was in, in heaven. He loved it. And that day we started our foundation. So we're going to be donating a book for every book we, we sell. But it's important. We, I did some research. Seven out of 10 kids in, in low-income families do not own any books at home. They miss out on that story time experience. And, and that's so important. You know, to, that story time experience is gamification, I feel. It's the, the engagement. It's you know, having all that back and forth banter, letting kids you know, uh, make the book come alive, basically. And, and yeah. that's what it's all about. So, uh, uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Michael. That's so incredible. And for everyone that's listening, engagement is, is a big topic. I think that that's one of the things that sets our world apart is the seven level in, uh, of engagements for brand to see the metrics of what is working and what is not working. Okay, is it the kid that doesn't understand it or is it our problem that we need to fix? We are not communicating properly. So the seven levels of engagement to truly make a creator, to truly make the brand, um, a brand like Apple, uh, like to have seven, uh, six and seven level uh, engagement uh, people, creators in our world. I think that that's what also is gonna set us apart. And so if you haven't seen that uh, Amanda Slavin expert and education helps uh, create that model um, and we're uh, gamifying it basically. So if you haven't watched it, um, we'll have that available. But Leanne, you can go into uh, maybe after uh, Jay, we'll we'll go into that more, just the the different levels of engagement. Um, Jay, I guess now jumping to more of a global scale um, for the developing countries, uh, leveraging new models, uh, play to learn, play to earn, uh, Web3 in general, um, even develop, uh, even developed countries like the US is not the best in education, right? So uh, correlating that incentive models with Web3 to education and improving education globally, we're trying to give, of course, the kids in uh, you know, Nigeria or Pakistan or uh, Philippines the same opportunity as, as the kid in Connecticut, for example, right? What is Prasaga and what are you guys doing to help globally at a global scale implement different models with uh, Web3? We're a very young company, so I'm not I'm not going to say we've we've got a lot of things that are by intention, but that we're still we're still building the blockchain. So yeah. um, just to be clear, I, not I, I don't want to take it, uh, credit for having done anything dramatic yet. I think when I get into a lot of these cultures and I was just in Vietnam and I've been in uh, Thailand and um, can't really count Dubai, although there are definitely some conversations I've had with, with expatriates there. The, the thing that, that really is that big bridge is access, access and being able to get on the, get internet connectivity as well as devices that, that you can learn on. And I think, when I look at, at the next step, it's going to be trying to make sure that we bridge into those populations. I mean, it sounds like starting with books is, 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 a, is a fundamental first step, but also finding ways to get them the devices that they can actually engage, mm-hmm. and communicate with the rest of the world. I think that's, that's going to be mission critical. Um, it, it's one thing to have, you know, a lot of these things feasible to be accessed in different parts of the planet, but it's still very early in many developing countries, how much access do they actually have? The phone actually is a huge step forward, even um, some not so smartphones. And I and I think the difficulty is we're, we're talking metaverse here, which is all three space and, and trying to do, you know, more next generation. And I, I've been looking at in a number of uh, what I call two and a half D type game environments that don't require the kind of horsepower um, that, that uh, you know, a full unity or unreal experience does. And I think that there, those are stepping stones we need to, to not miss. And, and even in terms of how much screen geography you can manage with a 3D avatar and the rest of it, sometimes just having a nice, 2D character that you've got in Roblox is is a really um, enabling part of the technology so that people can quickly work 
you know, in a, in a voxel environment to get this experience and not get the user interface in the way of, of figuring this stuff out. And I think that's, is we're working with the Sagaverse and moving forward, some of the conversation we're having is to look at what are the stepping stones without trying to just go to the bloody edge because that's not going to be as accessible planetary ways. Um, how do we how do we get there in an approachable approach that that will work on the devices that that are affordable to the majority of the planet? Yes, exactly. Thank you, Jay. And Leanne, going back to the fourth question, what screen time do you experience that is entertaining and valuable? Basically, that's one of the premises of MetaHug and Play to Learn. And that correlates back to the new models, of course, like Play to Learn for developing countries. And like Jay said, to get those devices out to the world to bring it to life. Of course, you know, you have to be able to make it, uh, you know, you may have a job, but you have to get to the job. And if that job is an hour away, how are you going to get from point A to point B? You have to solve that solution, even if you have a job. So being able to have a device and the good thing about Roblox, it is a low poly, right. uh, but That's being able to show that. On it, but yeah. So do you want to talk about the entertaining and valuable side? Yeah. Um, so yeah, and, and just to point out, uh, Roblox is low poly, and that's also the reason why the, the staggering number of 50 million users a day um, globally. <laughs> so um, clearly, that's it's uh, it's by numbers, and also uh, globally, everybody is on the platform. Like Jay said, it's just an easier access. So um, that was you know bridging doing with Prasago Web3 Education made sense to do it um, through Roblox first. But yeah, I think then going back to um, creating value within screen time. Um, this is what we, what we spoke before was you know um, <clears throat> I would say it's um, it's it's hard. You know, children are just like adults; they are motivated in different ways. So <clears throat> I think when we create value, um, we have to make it so that we meet where they're at and we understand. Um, well, if you actually play Roblox, you can actually um, uh, see how we are actually gamifying and bridging uh, the education. And <clears throat> it's interesting to see um, role play is probably the most popular game in, in Roblox. And, and, I, and I'm, when I'm playing house with um, when my, my sister, I used to play at the house and I used to play with laundry basket and like cardboard boxes. And, and now I'm playing, I, you know, I teleport when I'm traveling and I, uh, and I play with my daughter. Um, and uh, it's interesting because she's actually playing the same game. It's just, it's very similar. She goes, here, mommy, you know, let's go to the ice cream store or here, mommy, here, I'm going to give you the baby. Oh, we, we're going to have five babies. Like it's, it's really, it's, it's crazy. So, um, you know, just if, if we actually just, you know, meet the kids where they're at, I think we'll understand how we can make screen time more valuable instead of just judging and not actually making the change and, and complain about it. So I think that's the whole process, uh, you know, solving my own problems as a mom, as a single mom, um, and, you know, really just them being on the screen as much as I am on my laptop working, but we justify working being okay and it's valuable. So, you know, how do we go and bridge value and making their screen time um, more beneficial to all of us is kind of the idea. And in the last session, for those who missed it, she was going into detail about how you gamify education to be both entertaining and valuable. So if you don't, for example, understand math or science in the classroom, don't give up, guys. We still have a chance. We're going to focus on Web3 initially, but basically everything in the classroom that you may not get on that level um, in flow state, maybe you're just dead and, and inside you're like, why am I here? There is hope. It, there is hope. And that's the beauty of it. I don't want everyone to just give up and think that we can't do it. I think that we just have to wait. To we have a way to tap into that. And we're expanding curriculum, of course, daily. But I think that there is hope. And that's the beauty. And Andres, um, why don't you just discuss uh, question four and five as well, the same, basically, as, as you're son is experiencing that entertainment and value proposition of, like you said, it's like, do you want something that makes you money and productive, or do you want it to be um, entertaining? And I think with us, it can be a win-win, but then understanding other models like play to learn around the world, you know, in developing countries, just talk about that and what you've seen. 
Uh, Josh, so for me, it's, it's, it's different like for all of us were parents and I'm going a little bit back what I said at the beginning, like when I'm out with the kids, you know, we all, always feel guilty to give the iPads or the screen so we yeah. can get on with uh, dinner or just uh, have a nice moment in the restaurant or just they don't screen in the car. Um, but I'm getting more conscious about the, the, the screen time, you know, so I'm trying to find different ways so my kid can learn from what they're watching. And I'm controlling, not controlling, I'm, I'm uh, overviewing what they're watching on YouTube. So every time that they're going to watch something, I'm trying to see something that they haven't done before. So that's the best thing they can do right now before they start to do uh, games or something else, you know. So, for example, Emilio became really, uh, he didn't know anything about football. And this is quite, uh, this is, is something that helped us a lot because, yeah, screen time is being challenging. But then he started to watch football and listen to this. He started to watch videos of Ronaldo and Messi and all of that because his uh, schoolmates were doing it. And he didn't like football before. He didn't care about it. And then he started to watch all of these uh, videos of all these players. And then he get into football now. So he, we have the, the pitch here in the back. It's like have two goals. And now we are going to we play every two, three days football with him in, in, in the garden. So yeah. this is what the screen time make us go outside to play football, which is quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, but this is the other thing that I, I was thinking about Colombia. So Colombia, going back to a third world country, in mm. England or Dubai is easier because yeah, we, we, we are very lucky. We can go and do as anything that we want. You know, the government look after us. We can go at nice park is safe. Most of the, the parks here. Mm. But then you think in Colombia, somebody does in a very poor condition. So my family is massive. So I have people that is in a very not good condition of people that are very wealthy. That's, the, that's, that's what happened in third world country, you know? Poor is very poor or rich is very rich. Yeah. But I seen the screen time in Colombia have helped help a lot of people that don't have the resources for education going back again for kids that they need to walk hours to go to a school. This is changing their lives, you know? So the right to get an uh, an Android tablet that is not expensive. Maybe the government is going to supply this, but the screen time is totally different to the screen time that somebody is watching on on US. You know, so Colombia, the screen time for me, the kids get more because if they don't have proper education, so many of these kids are getting education through YouTube or through gamification through all of this new technology that we have. So for me, the screen time is very achievable as long as we know that in the future, the kids are going to be better, better off if they have somebody next to them. You know, if they don't have guidance, it's not going yeah. to be great. Exactly. And that's what I love about MetaHug is being able to have that kind and the balance of win-win-win between the parents' brands and the kids to have that dopamine, to have that high where they, in a good way, where it's, it's a it's a win-win, it's a feed and that's, John, going back to what you were saying, basically the color and the black and white. I, I want to jump to the last question and we're going to wrap this up. Um, beyond kids, can, can game-based learning work for adults? Um, and, uh, and how does it differ from kids, basically? So a lot of the, and why we basically chose to target, one of the reasons targeting kids, uh, basically younger demographic, is helping them because they're already in the games, right? They're already in that flow state with, the dopamine they're already in that flow state of learning and so they're just soaking it up so it's much easier for adults that aren't gamers um it's kind of a bit harder i guess to reach them at that point of the dopamine and in, in that flow state how do you how do you reach that flow state with the adults or or can you and uh, just talk about that a little bit Well, I think gaming is not just in like, you know, video games. Um, I think adults will be game gamified in the future, the near future, if not already in the metaverse. So I, I do believe gamification for all ages will work, um, especially with the metaverse and everything that we've been hearing that's coming with, you know, the glasses. Right. <laughs> so right now, where do you guys see, I mean, and John, maybe, I don't know if if you hear me, but um, what are some of the ways that the adults gamify and have that dopamine other than social media? 
how do you, I mean, that's more for a negative, I guess, use and more better for Facebook. Um, have you seen any ways that productive on uh, the dopamine and productive side for adults using this? Oh, oh productive. Oh, I don't know yeah. about productive. I've seen that's, stuff that works. I don't yeah. know. If- I don't know if no, it works from the Facebook side, right? It works from the Facebook <laughs> oh, side, works. but it doesn't work. Oh, from yeah, the- it works. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, my, my own personal experience doing the research is like we were simultaneously doing like live brain scans and stuff on people that were looking at a brokerage account website and making, you know, doing the work mentally and about you know, which is the most advantageous, profitable risk reward return. And with the same group of people, different phase, different environments, we, but so the same brain scan, we look at like, okay, would you like to contribute $5 to this GoFundMe campaign? You know what's easier to motivate? The GoFundMe campaign. Yeah. It's a, there's a fallacy yeah. that we all get sucked into thinking that we have to pay kids to do stuff or we had to pay people economics because we just, especially me, people like me, my people are capital markets people, right? We just think you have to pay for it. That's it's way easier. The dopamine is a much more powerful currency, all right? right? And there's lots of it, and it effectively is never diluted by the Fed. I mean, yeah. dopamine, you, you get a dopamine hit, and it works for adults really, 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 really well. I do think that this is an area of this whole ecosystem, Josh, that I got to be honest with you, I'm not even worried about it because designing it once we can give an objective of how, which once we can define content for people to learn, adults or kids, we yeah. can define and produce different ways to access and wrestle with that content. And then we can define a measurable outcome of what it means to have learned it. I think connecting those and optimizing it is going to be one of the best use cases for AI technology that we have, is designing yeah. ironically for AI to individualize the optimal way for each individual person, not just to access and experience, but to really truly deeply learn content and educational material. That's an area that's that's really just built, that's a perfect use case for AI. So I don't think we have to figure that part of it out. I don't think you guys, I'm not gonna do anything, but you, yeah. I don't think you guys have to worry about figuring that out. No. That's something that's gonna be figure outable on an individualized basis. Right, no, 100%, I think that it's good conversation to see where the metaverse goes. And Michael, I know you're talking about metaverse as we wrap it up and what you're doing in the metaverse and how that comes to life for an adult in the same way. Maybe it's easier now because kids are already on their gaming console. Uh, but for adults that, oh, this metaverse thing, oh, I don't know about it. What is this? You know, but they now in five years, they may have a different tune. You know, it becomes real life because it's in the car they drive. AR is in the car they drive. So when they parallel park, right, it's the subconscious that I'm looking at my screen and I'm literally parallel parking because now in front of me, it's showing me how to park, you know? So that I think the, the, the utility is going to be there in the next five years. And that's going to really change people um, and how they see that and eventually kind of hook them. Um, Michael, why don't you take a stab at that? Yeah, no, I, absolutely. I mean, I, I, it's, it, it goes beyond kids. This is, uh, yep. you know, our journey, our journey for learning never ends. And, uh, you know, it's human nature. We, we, you know, we want to just absorb everything. And, you know, that's how I've taught my kids to don't think you're only learning at a very young age. You're going to learn till the day you, you're, 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 and, you know, not part of this world anymore. But, uh, uh, for adults, I think, you know, there are questions on the metaverse. Yes. We get questions all the time. Like what's the metaverse? What is it about? You know, and you try to explain the web, 3.0 concepts of blockchain and and token based you know economies and it's still very very fuzzy. I mean um, you know this is the reason we're writing like I said we're writing this book on on crypto basics it's not only for kids and you know, we're saying it's from five to 105. Uh, you know it, it's something that is is needed. Uh, you know we're we're in this uh, you know learning as 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 we have talked about before learning um, is is really dependent on the times you live in. And on your environment, and and that's you know it's 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 a byproduct of the environment. I mean, look at look at the amount of learning that happened during the Renaissance, and look what it did for the economies in Europe. Look at the amount of learning that happened in in the Industrial Revolutions for the U.S., who became you know the the powerhouse that we are, uh, and and look at the, the stagnation during the Dark Ages. So it it really, and I think we're in the same same time right now. The crypto age, I mean, it's a it's transformational, and and the amount of learning that's going to happen now. 
and depending on companies like like these breakthrough pioneering companies in blockchain and, and what what Leon is doing with with MetaHug and all this, I, it's just it's just amazing. And we got to teach the masses. It's it's going to be hard to teach everyone, but slowly they're going to adopt. They're going to adapt. Adding philanthropy, I think, to the metaverse is huge because people are going to realize it's so easy to help others. You know, through this through this you know wonderful socialization network that was never there before, and how easy and accessible it is. So uh, yeah, no, it's it's uh, like gamification is for everyone. It's just not for kids. It's 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 there. It's it's going to be part of our lives. Yeah. Yeah, and and Jay, basically to summarize, and as we end it uh, with the Leon and Andres after, I I see you shaking your head as you summarize everything, and there's so much to go over. But after you've heard everything, um, and bringing it from, we're focused, of course, on age four to twenty five, but taking those same things, educating the same thing, we can teach about blockchain to a thirteen year old, and it's can be still applicable to a fifty year old, right? So being able to then scale the education side and what we're talking about together with Prasaga, you know, it's so exciting. But why don't you summarize what you're excited most about, Jay? I'll give you a quick anecdote. I was working with one of our advisors and he was talking about uh, the digital supply chain initiative that, that, that he was involved with. And they'd been using uh, Fortnite to get the next generation of engineers connected with the older generation in a team building exercise. And the key there was that the two generations weren't having a good methodology for communication. And when they got into Fortnite and started to to actually uh, do some training exercises in there, all of a sudden the technology transformation challenges that they had kind of became much more intuitive as to how they were going to engage those different completely like natives versus, uh, you know, in many cases, expatriates from, from technology. Uh, and I, the reason I get so excited about this, whether it's adults or kids, is that we said it earlier, play is the way humans have always been best at learning. And the way we can get those better integrated dopamine hips in the and be able to to embrace the idea of curiosity and and learning as part of our ongoing human experience together and as i watch technology go faster we're going to have to learn more efficiently because keeping up is not just about keeping track of the information it's about being able to keep learning at a pace that's that's accelerating that's one of the things I think I see these new paradigms of, of, of conversation with kids as well as adults really making a difference. It, and it's, it's not that it's going to be easier. I think it's going to probably, the challenges are going to be harder, harder than some of the things that we've done in the past, but we're going to see the results. And I think we can see those globally, I hope, to yeah. really, really get um the the human potential that's out there across multiple uh, peoples to be accessible and and I want to see it be a better quality of life not just yeah. a connected quality of life exactly I mean that's the idea from Etahug giving equal opportunity to kids in developing countries helping their families not just them the whole community become better by us empowering them with tools it's you know, learn, play, earn. It's being able to, so giving them the, the teaching them how to fish, right? And then not just them teaching them how to fish, but educating them how, if they caught a sea bass versus a salmon to sell that fish and then where online are you going to sell it and how are you going to sell it? So being able to give an end-to-end tutorial and that's what all of you do so well. I think the beauty of the knowledge here is incredible. I know, Andres, do you have any thoughts as you end? Um, Leanne, John, would love to, to hear your thoughts as we end. We have maybe just 30 seconds if we can summarize, Andres, if you have what you've heard today and what you... Yeah, so uh, guys, thank you so much for the time. Uh, I just want to, to summarize this with something that I, I saw today in a post saying that the best games are the ones that come with no instructions. Mm. You think we we learned so many games, so you know, cool. when we were little that we didn't have instructions. Starting with Atari, Nintendo, Super Nintendo, these things were difficult to complete. 
Um, and I think it's happening right now with blockchain and obviously cryptocurrency. All of us were here because of Web3 and blockchain and probably we heard crypto at one point in our life, but none of us, I don't know, well, I, I haven't been in, in, in university learning about blockchain. 99% of the people that learn about blockchain is because they start to saw on, on a post, on a Reddit or Twitter, whatever. And then we start to educate ourselves, you know? And I think so that's the magic about, about blockchain and Web3, like it's putting us together to learn, like the kids, they have to learn sometimes with with no instructions, going back to that. Um, something that Jay said right now about the uh, generation of people playing Fortnite, I was playing with my son FIFA the other day and he he kicked my, my ass, you know? <laughs> so I think that in 20 years, you know, he's only been playing it for three months. So I just, I look, I just leave you for that, guys. That we, the the future generations are smarter than us, but blockchain and web three is making it possible that we coexist together. And remember, the base games have no instructions, and this is it. Man, I love it. You guys are insightful. Yeah, this is valuable stuff here, guys. Wow, thank you so much, John, Michael, Leanne. Anything. I'm just real quickly, I, I'm reminded, just following up on Andres' comment, I'm reminded of Noah, Noah, Nolan Bushnell, who was founder of Atari, uh, was developed what was called Bushnell's Law, which is games should be easy to learn, difficult to master. Mm. That games should, should reward, the reward <laughs> system should be focused on two ends. The first 25% first quartile of performance on the way in, and the last 100% you know, percentile. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's what we've got. We've got so much learning that we can take mm -hmm. from Atari up to, up to Roblox and then apply that in the educational context. It is an intersection of two of the most powerful forces we've got in the world today. And what a great time to be alive. Well, thank you guys, man. This is incredible. So much gold here. It's wow. So it's it's great. So thank you guys. Thank you for everything. I, I truly appreciate everyone being a part of it. Um, I I mean just so much, so much to be said. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for being a part, Leanne. It's incredible. Thank you. And we'll do it again, of course. The collaboration in Web3 is immense. So we're gonna collaborate, we're gonna do and help many people through every every part. It's eyes, ears, nose, mouth. Every, everyone has their own job to do a part of the body. And that's the beauty of this group, influencers, Andres, like millions of people access, like to be able to have uh, bits and pieces of everything that we have here is truly immense. I really appreciate it. Each one of you, thank you for your insight. It's very valuable and for the kids to be able to listen and to intake this and educate them in the future and future games. So thank you. We are going to take a 60 second break